alluded to, this in this slide is the uh, right-hand column on the classification of the different types of regulatory environments. So where does this come about? So the idea is that we can do where the different countries are on the point scale of 1 to 100. But it doesn't necessarily tell you much of any qualitative similarities between them. It just tells you a point scale where they are, that it's between 1 and 100. And you can say, well, in this, the US is high, European Parliament is low. But it doesn't really clearly tell you the different type of regulatory system that it's at play. So one of the things that we kind of played with the idea, I guess we're all in some ways social scientists influenced by Max Faber, whether we like it or not. Um, and one of the things that he always talked about, especially in his discussion of the bureaucracies, is what's referred to as an ideal type or basically a conceptualization of something that will take on certain characteristics. And I think inspired by that, it's sort of, it's even when you think of biology and how it works for classification schemes. My first two years in university were actually studying chemistry. They weren't studying political science. So I think I've been influenced by that more uh, natural science way of thinking when it comes to classifications. And so we thought, okay, the points go thing is nice, but it doesn't really tell us of any clear qualitative similarities. So then we came up with this idea of high, medium, and low classification of different types of regulatory environments. So this is, I'm not going to go too much in detail because I think maybe we'll save that for the seminar. We can go into some detail of what we mean. This is sort of the idea in general of what the classification scheme is there to help us understand the different trends and the differences between the different uh, types of systems. Quantitatively, we saw that there were three types or three ranges of, of quantitative analysis. There were those systems between point scores of 1 and 29, then those between 30 and 59, and then those over 60. Now, given that our highest observation at the time was Washington State, which had a score of 87, we haven't gone through the state's analysis here, um, we thought that that gave us a roughly similar quantitative range of around 28 to 30 points where you can see a kind of breakdown from a quantitative point of view. But more importantly, from the qualitative point of view, when we kind of did a textual analysis of the different pieces of legislation, we could see that there were striking similarities and differences between those that were found under 30 points, those between 30 and 60, and those over 60. We'll go over that in a second quickly, but you could see from a that you have uh, a very uh, similar type uh, of dis uh, si si you have a very similar type of characteristics that are found. So what we did is what we refer to as a threefold classification scheme of different types of regulatory environments. It's a pretty simple classification scheme. It's low, medium, and high regulation systems. On the one hand, I don't think any of our colleagues have criticized us for being too simple because I think simplicity is sometimes very easy. But the advantage of this that we found was that when policymakers have had a chance to look at our work and develop their own legislation, they could conceptualize, they could conceptualize, sorry, they could conceptualize very clearly the different types of regulatory environments that exist. Okay, so just in a nutshell, basically is what the terms would say, in a low regulatory system, you don't have much regulation. You don't ask for much information, for example, from your lobbyists. You don't have things like cooling off periods, and there's no such thing as a spending disclosure. And when it comes to medium, well, you have a bit more information that's given by lobbyists. Uh, you have other things such as cooling off periods which exist, but you don't have spending disclosures. Whereas high then basically is where you get everything, that you have a lot of information given by lobbyists, you have spending disclosures that are given, and you have cooling off periods that are, that are existence as well. Okay? So that, that's basically the crux of the argument uh, of these different slides here. I guess what was interesting for us is, and what's, what the characteristics you can kind of see, again, um, the individual registration exists, but there's not much detail. There's no executive branch lobbying when it comes to uh, regulation and lowly regulated system, no spending disclosure, um, not much information given, no cooling off periods. So we kind of refer to it as a type of legislation that's there, but it's almost a bit like window dressing. Right? The rules are there, but they're not very strong, and the lobbyists aren't expected to give too much information. Right? 
Now, the jurisdictions you saw, and this is, this is what's significant for our work, I guess, for this class. In its original iteration in the European Parliament, it was really a lowly regulated system. Not a lot of information was given by lobbyists. There wasn't much information available to the public, um, et cetera. We see this in Germany, sorry for the typo there, uh, European Commission in its original iteration in 2008, uh, France, and of course the United Kingdom. And this is an interesting point because this was created uh, at a time that the Cameron government was wanting to develop legislation, but in wake of almost a fear that there's going to be a scandal. They didn't want too much regulation though, which is consistent with a conservative government. Yeah, I think you can say. I don't think. I think you can. Of course, conservative governments have developed lobbying laws, but the Tory conservatives in the UK, in particular, didn't want to have too much regulation. So that's reflected in its point score there as well, uh, and the original uh, Polish legislation as well. So your more medium regulated systems, again, in a nutshell, more information has to be given by lobbyists. There is cooling off periods in particular. There's stronger online registration. Uh, state agency will control, the regulators will control, can, uh, perform audits and could potentially give fines uh, to the lobbyists for breaking the rule. This has existed. So you find that in the new European Union Joint Transparency Register. Not so much the fines, of course, because it's not a mandatory system, but in terms of the detailed information that's giving, that's being given by lobbyists, and in effect in the European Union Joint Transparency Register, financial information has to be given as well. Again, it's voluntary, but we now see, and we'll talk about in a second why, most firms register and most lobbyists registering. But they're the only re uh, jurisdiction within Europe that actually requests information, financial information and money spent on lobbying activity in any one year from the lobbyists. So it gives you an idea um, and maybe even in class if we can get on the computer in the seminar we can go over some individual registrations of the, in the Joint Transparency Register which you'll find interesting. Um, <clears throat> but it's the only place in Europe where you actually have that information that's given which is, which is quite a, a, a I'm not going to say pioneering because obviously this has been done in U.S. jurisdictions for years but I think it is pioneering in the context of the European Union. Okay? Austria, Australia, Lithuania, Hungary, when it had its old legislation, and uh, Canada would have medium uh, re regulated systems as well. Interesting thing on Canada, we got a Canadian member in the audience. Uh, it has one of the highest cooling off periods of any jurisdiction in the world. What do you think it is? How many years do you think they require people to cool off before they go from federal politics to lobbying? Five years, correct. Yes, five years. Uh, most other jurisdictions are between two and one um, year. So, and then of course the high regulated systems. I suppose the important thing to note is the difference really between high regulated systems and medium is that it asks for financial spending disclosures. So even though the Joint Transparency Register has that characteristics, on other points, on the other categories, it scores relatively low to the U.S. federal. So it's not a highly regulated system. But the highly regulated systems in the United States all have very extensive spending disclosure requirements. Okay? So lobbyists have to clearly file that, how much they've spent, itemized with receipts in most cases, uh, particularly for uh, Washington State is the strongest uh, regulated system uh, in particular. Okay? So where do we take the EU from this from a comparative perspective? Well, in terms of our CPI scoring, we see that it's becoming more robust with time. That it's gone from the days of the European Parliament having the most lowly regulated system to now having a medium regulated system with this joint register with the European Commission. So it's improving, if we can use that word, uh, quite extensively. It's still wanting on some grounds. The first is that it's not mandatory registration for lobbyists. And this really, I think, if I can use the term Achilles heel, it really is the problem with the European Union uh, um, initiative at this stage, is that it hasn't made registration mandatory. That said, increasingly, commission <laughs> officials uh, are not talking, the European Parliament officials as well, are not talking with lobbyists who are not registered. What that basically means is that over time, 
it's become effectively a de facto mandatory system, even if it's not factually a mandatory system. All right. So I think the Commission has been very cognizant of the fact that it wants to improve and increase transparency. And the public image is, is obviously only going to be strong if people are seen to be complying with these different initiatives. So it's not uncommon then to have received that order to not talk with lobbyists unless they're registered, which basically means that if you're a lobbyist who is not registered, you won't get an appointment, right? So it's in your interest effectively to register. And so most lobbyists, uh, I think it's fair to say, have registered. We still don't know that magic number of 15,000. Could be 15, it could be 12, right? It's hard to say. Um, but even though it is voluntarily, effectively, it has become mandatory um, at this stage, right? So there's something to be said. That said, there is a Joint Transparency Register Secretariat, not well staffed, but because it is voluntary, it has no effective ability to be able to sanction fines. Okay? Because the system is voluntary, you can't be penalized for not complying with the rules of registering because there really are no effective rules to register because it's not required of you. This is making any sense, right? So you, 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 the, only, the only thing that will happen to you if you're not registered is that you won't be on specific email lists for your area of interest. That's the only thing that you won't get if you're not registered. But if, for example, you've given false information on your registration, they can't give you a fine for it. Whereas in other jurisdictions, you can. Yes? If you're not registered? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, in principle, in principle, from our understanding, commission officials are less likely to be involved, I don't know about lunch, but certainly involved in, in receiving a lobbyist if they're not registered. As for the specific nuances of lunch, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know about the menu of the lunch? No, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hey, this is Europe. Everyone goes for lunch, right? So it's, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, so that's a little bit where we see the Joint Transparency Register he heading. I don't, I, I'm aware that I want to open this up for questions, and it's already 20 minutes to 7, which time we're supposed to be done. So I'm just going to go very quickly about something that I think a lot of governments use as a justification to not develop a lobbying law. They oftentimes say that we don't want to develop this lobbying law or a lobbying law because it costs too much money. Right? If we develop a register, we have an independent regulator, we try to collect all this information, ensure that lobbyists are complying and not giving incorrect information, you need a staff of an independent regulator, or in some cases, like we've seen in some EU states, having part of a ministry that's dedicated to running this register. Right? So the justification is, is that, well, if you have a robust system, this will be a lot of cost to our state. Uh, and that's a fair point. It's a fair point. Uh, it, we see that some jurisdictions, Washington State, federal office in Canada, um, they're sizable staff offices. You require a building, you require 25 people on X thousand a year, uh, varying on that range of salary from the senior to the lower, which can cost the state a lot, right? Having a, a register that's electronic set up. Lobbyists themselves might have to give quarterly reports on their activities, so it costs them resources as well throughout the whole registration process. So a lot of states say, well, we don't want to get into this because it costs money. But they ignore the real benefits of these systems is that they're giving people information that they, they, they not only don't have, but a lot of people demand to know who is talking to who about what. And so that's why we would tell the Greek government, if it's listening, uh, that effectively you should think about the positive kickbacks about having lobbying laws. When we say kickbacks, what are the advantages? Well, basically, the first thing we notice is that the biggest consumers of these registers are the actual lobbyists themselves. And these lobbyists will be seeing what their competitors are doing. Again. We're looking at lobbyists as professionals that are doing a job legitimately and transparently. 
And they see themselves like that as well, right? And so what they will want to see, they'll check the register every week to see if there's any differences or different changes of their competitors and see who's lobbying who about what. And then use that information as lobbyists to up their game, right? So this is something that um, surprisingly we found in our initial research, we still see it, <clears throat> that as much as this is intended to target citizens uh, to increase everyone's knowledge about lobbying, it's the actual professionals themselves that are using this information, which really in retrospect isn't that surprising. And they will use this information also to show their own clients what they're doing and legitimately doing, right? Do you want to see what we did this year? Well, why don't you check our registration with the lobbyists, and you'll see all the things we tried to influence. It's a very easy way to, to save a lot of time uh, in terms of convincing your members of what you're doing. So the other positive kickback is that we see this as citizens, all this information, we really realize that lobbyists are professionals and they really are legitimate policy making actors because there's nothing secret about what they're doing. It's not about these smoke filled back rooms where lobbyists are cutting deals. It's not about that at all. It's about them legitimately saying, we have a specific interest in this and we're trying to influence government in this. And it makes the whole uh, process much more open. Uh, and politicians also receive the kickbacks because they're able to openly say that they're meeting with lobbyists themselves. So this is something um, that we see as a kickback that's really uh, important. So I, I suppose to summarize, there's a lot of things that we, we've done here. It's focused a lot on the EU, um, but it's also been a more international global context of what's going on as well. And so international experience shows us there's different ways to regulate lobbying. I suppose that the other thing I wanted to start with is that we should not forget that lobbying is a legitimate activity. There's different ways to regulate it and which way you want to do it will depend on the goals of the different governments in power and what they want to see, whether it's low or medium or high regulation. Uh, the EU experience is, is a positive one overall. It started from being a relatively uh, window dressing type of initiative in the 1990s at the parliamentary level to now becoming one where a lot of information is given by lobbyists uh, when they try, when they have to register if they want it to influence the parliament or, or the commission. Yeah, the mandatory registration, however, is still missing, so that should be something um, that they deal with. So the last part basically said, yes, there are costs, and I guess this is a bit of a, a, a how do you say, a recommendation to any state that doesn't have lobbying laws, that there are costs associated with having them, but the benefits will outweigh those costs in terms of promoting transparency, accountability, and of course, uh, good government. Right, so it's something that all policymakers should keep in mind. Okay, I think I'm done. Do you have any questions that you you want to ask for clarification? So, there, so there's open data, you're saying? Yeah, it's open data in terms of the registration data for the countries that have lobbying laws or the political systems that have lobbying laws. You can go to the registers and you can see who's registered. And usually they have, have searchable databases that would allow you to see not only the people that are the organizations that are registered, but also different information on them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to follow up. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so are there any other, other initiatives to open up the data and increase transparency? So are there other initiatives? For other, for other things. Yeah, okay, so would there... For, for deciding, you know, yeah, I mean, so different departments or ministries will have different information posted on their websites with regard to a legislative footprint at times. It depends on the country. The other sunshine laws we refer to in the literature to, to allow the public to see what's going on in government, largely speaking, you would have freedom of information laws. Uh, you would have um, different initiatives on ethics reform that would make different civil servants and politicians disclose uh, for example, um, different financial information on their parts to prevent conflict of interest, that would be one. Another type of transparency law is whistleblowing legislation, but it's not, not totally related to, to this um, sort of thing. But I, I guess you should conceptualize this as basically trying to better understand the relationship between private actors trying to influence public officials. Right? 
freedom of information will allow you as a citizen to see what's going on in public institutions. It doesn't allow you to see the relationship between private actors and public institutions. It just allows you to see what's going on within that public institution. Right? Ethics reform, again, is looking mostly at the actions of public actors in terms of their potential conflicts of interest. So the reason why this is specifically important as a, as a transparency policy is that it's the only one that allows us to better understand the regulation between public and private, which is a big deal because we don't know what, how public actors are influenced by private actors other than through this lobbying. Thank you very much. Great.